morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I am your host, Sherrard. Hope you're having a wonderful Saturday morning. Some places it's actually already Sunday, but whatever day it is, the Lord bless you to be in. You enjoy it and make the most of it. I'm excited for today, today's episode of the show. Today's episode is entitled, Great Music is Alive and Well. We have a living legend on the show, actually, ladies and gentlemen. This gentleman is the, the individual who replaced Lionel Richie back in 1982 and in 83 uh, from the Commodores. This man has made great music. The list goes on and on about some of the people he sang with, performed with from Stevie Wonder to Celine Dion. The list goes on. We're going to talk about that. And now also I'm going to display the list and we're going to be talking about global music changing the world. The Sherrard Show is brought to you by iHeartRadio. And whenever you want to listen to the Sherrard Show and watch it, you can also watch it or listen to it on iHeartRadio. Just add it to your Roku or even just add it to your smart device and you can hear the best episodes of your life from Smokey Robinson to Stevie Wonder to Rick Ross. The list goes on of those who stop by the Sherrard Show. And then it's also brought to you by Queen Team Apparel. Queen Team Apparel makes some of the nicest apparel, custom t-shirts, custom clothes all over the world. The information is right on your on, on her website. Information is right on your screen. And you can be able to click it and get your order today. Now, when it comes to great music, oftentimes you think of the legends. You think of the impressions. You think of the Dales, the Dramatics, Stevie Wonder, Sam Cooke. You think of Isaac Hayes. And you also think about the Commodores, ladies and gentlemen. One of my favorite songs from the Commodores is Zoom. But then Easy Like Sunday Morning and things like that goes on as well. And I am just honored to have one of the members of the Commodores here, Mr. Skylar Jett on the Sherrard Show for the first time. Good morning, sir. I know it's evening where you are. How are you? I'm feeling blessed. And I love that you said that about Zoom. Uh, would you mind if I uh, uh, put an invitation out to Ronald LaPrade who wrote Zoom? Please. To to come on your show. He wrote Brick House and Zoom. Oh my goodness, that'd be absolutely wonderful. He's, he's a bass player. He lives in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, he flew over here to London to hang out with me for 10 days, man. It was really beautiful. I hadn't seen him in years. And uh, I live with him uh, on his 27 acre ranch down in uh, Tuskegee, Alabama. Wow, wow. Yeah. Now, um, let me, let's talk about a few things. We have so much to talk about and we will take your questions as they come, ladies and gentlemen. Now, first of all, being a young buck in the 80s and you get the call to replace a legend like Lionel Richie as a lead singer in the, in the Commodores, what was that like for you? It was, it was magical, but then I, I think of, you know, how many singers there is between Oakland in Alabama, and that just don't happen. Just something just amazing happened to me, man. It's like uh, I was living in North Hollywood and a friend of mine uh, called me up. He used to be with the Beach Boys and he called me up and said, Skyler, the, the Commodore's manager just died. And they got a new manager, his name is Chuck Smiley and he works at ABC television. And he's about to be the new manager. And I told him about you and I like for him to come by your place and, and talk to you. And uh, Sherrod, the craziest thing happened because my girl had just left me. Uh, I was getting, getting evicted from my place because I didn't have any money. I lost my job because I was supposed to go on the road with Marvin Gaye. And at that time, I was, uh, on Coenga, uh, there was Alexander Stationaires there. And I was driving a truck for Alexander Stationaires. And I started playing basketball with this guy out in, out in uh, uh, what's the name of that town? This uh, over the hill when you go, it's uh, when you go over the hill, uh, Barham Hill. What's that town called? Some Santa Clarita. No, when you go over Barham. Oh, uh, oh, 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 oh. Um, it's not ringing the bell, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, that that, that whole area was like studios, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, there was a basketball gym there, and I used to play basketball there all the time. And I kept playing with this brother getting on my team. Come to, we never asked each other what we did and come to find out he was Marvin Gaye's drummer and, and he was Rick James' drummer. Wow, how legendary can you get? I, but, I, but, but, I, but the crazy thing, Sharon, I'm, I'm playing basketball with these guys. It was a lot of the soap opera guys uh, would play, take their lunch and, and, you know, play ball, right? But we never asked each other, we just playing. But, but one day, man, a, 
I hurt, I hurt my leg and I'm at home and my, my girl goes, we, we, she's watching some soap operas, right? And she goes, oh man, those guys are great. I said, wait a minute, hold on. I play basketball with that dude every day, <laughs> right? So he, he actually told me a lie that turned, turned into getting me to the governor. So he said, he said that he wrote this song and he, he wanted me to write lyrics to it. And he took me to Marvin Gaye's studio over there on Sunset Boulevard, right? And I got in there and the dude said, man, how would you? I said, I play congas too. He said, how would you like to go on the road with us, man? Marvin Gaye is coming back from, from Belgium and uh, I'd like to put you in the band. And I, wait, then, then I was making about $350 a week and he brought me a, a contract for $900 a week. That was a no brainer, right? So I went into my job and said, this is the last day it was a William Morris contract. I said, this is my last day. I'm, I'm not going to be here anymore. And But I went over to his studio, man, to Marvin Gaye's studio, and I wrote lyrics to this song. And all of a sudden, this uh, uh, this guy comes over. It was a white guy come, comes in. And and my that guy that I wrote, so-called wrote the song with, went to the bathroom. This this guy goes, hey, man, I really like the lyrics that you wrote on, on that song, man. I said, yeah, but this is, this is Bugsy's song. He, he go, no, that's my song. And Bugsy came out of the bathroom, man. And he found out that that dude that told me, told me that he wrote the song. And the guy goes, you know what? I, I was giving this to a taste of honey, but I like your, I like your lyrics better. Okay, fat, let me fast forward past that. Two weeks later, I'm getting evicted from my place. My girl had left me. I, I don't have no lights in the house. I ain't got no, no nothing, right? And... I used to go to Don, Donna Summer's church and, and uh, I forget the name of that street. What it, uh, I forget the name of the street right there. But anyway, I used to go to her church and Philip Bailey and I was on the basketball team. We used to play against Denzel uh, Washington at, Holly, at Hollywood High. So now wait a minute. Now, Scott, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you for a second now. How are you with all this money? around you and and most of it you didn't know that these were the who they were or you found out later that they were the who's who well i, I didn't have any money when i when i moved from oakland over there i didn't have any money i was driving a truck right but but what happened was like i said because of that lie this guy calls me up and he says skyler the commodore's manager just died and a friend of mine chuck smiley is about to be the new manager of the commodores and i want to sit him by your house and you play him some of your tunes. Well, Sherrod, you and I are old enough to know about cassettes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and eight tracks. Come on, oh, now you're going back. <laughs> okay, so so I had all these cassettes, man, in a Raider bag, out from Oakland, right? So this guy drives up to my house, man, and back back then, I was, like I said, living in North Hollywood, I was living in a cottage, and the old lady that owned the place, she lived in the front. Now, my next door neighbor in, in this duplex, I was, was the lead singer of New Birth. Oh wow! Right? Okay, yeah. so so that means you know Jerry Bell. I don't know him, mm -hmm. but I, I forget the guy's name. He lived right next door too. And but anyway, so the guy comes to my house, and he said, "Play me some songs, man." And I start playing him some songs. Well, remember I was telling you about Donna Summer. So her cousin Manny played basketball with me all the time. He 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 called me over to uh, Century City to do an aud audition for Dream Girls, right? And so I got to catch the bus from North Hollywood all the way out to Century City. Oh, man. So this guy comes to my house and he listens to my songs. He said, man, you got some great songs, man. You know what? I'm going back to my office in Century City and I'm going to play the Commodores your songs. Where are you going to be at later today? I said, this is crazy, man. I'm about to go jump on a bus and go to Century City because I'm auditioning for Dream Girls, right? And he said, well, I'll drop you off. This true story. Wow. He dropped me off. It had to be about 150 male vocalists in line, right? Back then, I didn't know what SAG or AFTER was, right? <laughs> so we're, we're all standing in line, telling jokes and stuff. All of a sudden, they say, everybody with SAG and AFTER, come up front, which shifts us back, back into the line. I was there about an hour and a half. That guy came, and he ran up the hill, and he said, hey, man. Now, I'm around a bunch of people. We're telling jokes, right? He said, hey, man. The Commodores want you to come to Alabama tonight. I got a flight for you at eight o'clock. It was about four then, right? I said, man, wait, hold on, man. I, I, I got to catch a bus home. And everybody in line like, man, what the hell are you doing in this line if you got a 
chance to audition for the guy, the Commodores, right? I and I'm I'm thinking to myself, this is crazy because my girl got to come back the next day and move her stuff out because we get evicted. True story. He said, here's fifty dollars, man. Catch a cab, go back to your house. I'm coming to pick you up at five thirty. And back then it started getting dark, dark a little earlier because it's winter time, right? And I'm going, this, this is crazy because I, I don't, there were no cell phones back then. I'm calling her at her aunt's house and she, you know, God bless you. She, that was my ex-wife. She dead now, but he was, he, you know, I'm calling the phone like crazy and stuff like, and she wouldn't, nobody would answer the phone. So I'm thinking, oh my God, this is crazy. So he comes up in the limousine this time to pick me up. And he drives, he drives up in the driveway and the, the old lady, she about 80 years old who owned my cottage in the back. What, what is this car doing in my, 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 my driveway? And, all? Uh, and, and, and the guy goes, well, what's the problem? He said, Skyler, turn on some light, man. I say, brother, I, I, I don't think I can go. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to go. He, he said, why? He said, I, 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 I'm getting evicted tomorrow, brother. I don't have no money for rent. I was supposed to be going on the road with Marvin Gaye and his father killed him. That was in this 1984. Time. That was in 84. That, was that, that 84? Yeah, Martin, uh, Marvin Gates' dad killed him in 84. Was it? Okay. It, anyway, he, he goes to me. I'm going to send you to Alabama tonight, man. They got, I got you a ticket. And I, I get on the plane, man. Me and Vesta Williams, a great singer. She died too. But it, anyway, we're on the plane together, right? And I didn't know she was going to be the background grow up background and we sitting there I'm, I'm, I'm chopping it up and this girl fine you know <laughs> right and we get off the plane and 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 she said where are you going I said I'm going to audition for the Commodore she said I am too I'm going to take some background for them right okay so check this out next thing you know man I get the Commodores on the the holiday inn then back in Tuskegee so I'm, I'm going to my room Sherrod and every room that I pass by these guys in there singing Commodore songs. Now, I don't even know none of the Commodore songs. <laughs> Cause I was singing rock and jazz, right? So, so, and every, I said, the Commodores must be here, man. They must be in the, in the hotel, right? And, and the guy gives, gives me some, some meal tickets and stuff. And he goes, he goes, man, check it out. What I would do, we're gonna pick you up in the morning in the van and take you over to, uh, take you over to the Commodore's facility in, in Tuskegee. And I get there, Sharon, and I'm like, seven guys got in that van with me. And it was all them guys that were singing Commodore songs. And they knew them by heart. This true story. So next thing you know, man, I, I'm not going to get this gig, I'm saying to myself. So what I'm going to do is, whatever somebody come out to ask, you guys go. Take, take this guy next. Take this guy next. <laughs> so there's one brother, he said, man, how come... How come you don't want to go? How come you don't? How come you're trying not trying to go back there? I said, brother, I don't, I don't know the Commodore songs. He started laughing at me, right? So this guy, the guy came out. He said, well, check it out, bro. He said, I'm gonna give you some lyrics. I'm gonna give you a cassette player, a, a boombox, and you go in this room and you start learning the tunes. This true story. It got down to the last guy, which is me. And 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 uh. uh Walter Orange, the one that sings Brick House. He was the original drummer. He comes out and he goes, who's left? I said, me. And he sees, he sees I got the lyrics in my hand, right? So, so he goes, he go, all right, brother, check it out. We're going to send these other guys back to the hotel. We're going to go get something to eat. You want something to eat? Said, okay. He, so he said, when we get back, then you come sing. Okay. Now, everybody left. I'm in, the, I'm in this facility by myself learning Lionel songs. What I found out was every one of them brothers that went to go audition, they singing all kind of licks and trying to show the comedy. Ah, I, I can do everything, right? And all I did was, and wait a minute, hold on. So when you walk in their place, the they, they got the control room here. Then it's a big room with a stage in it. That's where they rehearse. And way on the other side is the vocal booth. So I, I go in there, Sherrod, and I, I set the lyrics up on the stand. But they, they, they're looking at me, but they forgot to turn the, uh, the talk back off, right? So I can, hear, I, I can hear them talking. And they're cracking up at me, man. This dude don't even know the lyrics. Oh, man, this is crazy, right? So I say, brother, go. Wait, wait, what you want to sing? I, I say, I don't know. Um, 
How about sail on and three times a lady? And, and he said, go ahead and sing. I started singing. I got past the first verse. I got to the first hook. And they said, oh, stop, 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 stop. Well, first they said, brother, whatever you do, don't sing no licks. Every one of them guys singing licks. <laughs> okay. Well, I wasn't going to sing no licks because I didn't know to sing some licks, right? And so, so I, I got to the, to the first hook. And they said, where are you from, brother? I said, I'm from Oakland, but I, but I actually live in North Hollywood. And sing the, second, sing the rest of the song. I sang the rest of the song, brother. Three weeks, I went home. Three weeks later, they called me back. I went on the roads for two years, taking a line of Richie's place. Holy cow. Now, holy cow. What a story. What a story. But and it's now, all true. Uh, uh, Skyler, we, we all believe you and the lines are um, lighting up. We'll get to your questions in a moment. <laughs> now, Skyler, um, so what happened? What was waiting for you when you got back to North Hollywood? Well, well, now one of the brothers that was singing, he was actually one of the guys, William King's cousin. I didn't know that, right? So when I got back there, it was just him and I. So the tailor guy took me in the room and I tried on. I'm wearing Lionel Richie's clothes, man. He farted in clothes and stuff like that. So I... No, I, he just, <laughs> he's just taller than me, but, but I was light skinned, you know, and his brother's a little darker and they, they took me, man. They took me. The no, tribute no, no, thing. But Skyler, what I mean is that you were a day from being evicted. So what happened with that? They gave, they gave me some money, man. Well, no, no. Oh, let me stop. Let me stop. When I told the guy that I, I couldn't pay my rent, he said, how much is your rent, brother? I said, $500, man. He peeled me off five Benjamins. And I wouldn't pay the lady. But I'm thinking to myself, my girl doesn't know that I've taken off and I can't call her. Like I said, it wasn't no, it wasn't no cell phones back then, right? So, so man, I, I went on and did that and I came back. And then, you know, we went on the road, man, and, and the rest is history. But, you know, uh, you know. What a I was history. Made- what a history. I, I never knew that story, what, what happened until you told it. I never knew it. I just knew that you replaced Lionel Richie um, and you did a wonderful job filling those shoes because Lionel Richie had some really tough shoes to fill because he was a hit maker, as you know. Now, how did the group receive you when they first met you and you uh, initially went on the road with them? Well, the bass player, Raul LaPrea, he turned into be my big brother who wrote, the, he was a big... He said, Skyler, we're not gonna put you in a hotel no more. You go, you're gonna stay with me. So I live, I had kept my apartment in, in North Hollywood, but I lived in Tuskegee for two years in Alabama, right? And that's a culture shock, brother, going for I, how many people in LA? About 13 million or something, right? Mm-hmm. In the whole area, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you go to Tuskegee, man, there's only two lights in the whole town. <laughs> oh, oh, and I'm, I'm, I'm now, Skyler, my question is, why Tuskegee? Why were they huh? there? Sorry. That was that was serious c- culture shock for me, man. Going from lights and lights and like that, you know, and, and then you got T- uh, Tuskegee uh, Institute. The college was the biggest thing in town. That was but about you know, it. But you know what the cool thing was, man? When 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 they picked me up in Montgomery, Alabama, and we drive into Tuskegee. Uh, when you get into Tuskegee, it says, "Welcome to Commodore Country." And and you know they they named. They named streets after every one of their names. Oh wow! In oh, Tuskegee, wow. right mm-hmm. now, their brothers went to the institute. They, that's a, they became friends and they started that band like that. And you know, uh, I used to have a radio show too for for three years back home. And Ronald came on my show, and he told he told the story of how exactly how I told how they picked me, right? Mm-hmm. And it's so beautiful, man. But but uh, after two years, I was like, shoot, man, I want you know. I want to raise, right? I was making nine hundred dollars a week. Those dudes, those dudes were making nine thousand dollars a week. They put now. What's 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 really smart about the Commodores is them brothers put themselves on salaries. I had never seen that before. Oh, wow! <laughs> oh wow! So they, put so they self- got they got guaranteed money <clears throat> no matter how long they work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the cool thing about it, Sherrod, is. They were buying up hotels and real estate. These brothers are really smart. You know what I mean? I ain't never seen that through a band. So, so they say, you know, we can live off $9,000 a week. And, and it t- they took the rest of the money. As, and that's, that's why every one of them got homes and everything like that. Because they were some smart brothers, man. Uh, wow. Um, now, now, Skyler, um, 
So why did Lionel Richie initially leave? He just wanted to start a solo career? No. Well, so when, when the manager died, Lionel basically said, you know what? I'm writing mostly all the hits. I, I, I can go here my chance to do my own thing, right? And sure enough, he did. He wrote that, he wrote that, uh, start writing for Kenny Rogers, if you remember. Yes, correct. He wrote Lady for him. Beauty and the Beast, all that, all that kind of stuff like that. And he said, here's my chance to, you know, now they scrambling, trying to figure out who will be the leader of the band and all that kind of stuff like that, right? Because he, the, the, the slower tunes he wrote. I want to, I want, my favorite song from the Commodores was uh, Sail On. Now, why was that one? Because you all had so many great songs, like you say, Zoom, Brick House, Easy Like Sunday Morning. But why was Sail On? Because so Ron, Ronald had a 27 acre ranch where we lived at, right? And he would go out in the backyard, start hunting and whatever, you know, shooting his guns and stuff. I, I, I'm from Oakland. I'm trying, last thing I want to do, hear any guns, right? <laughs> but, 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 he, but he go, he go, Skyler, you know, and, and it was true. They had one radio station there at that time, right? Now, they only played black music at 10 o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock at night. So all the song, all of the music between was either rock or country. So they listened to country a lot and they said, you know what? Let's write a country song. And they wrote Sail On, but here's what happened. When they did that song and it came out, they lost their black audience. And the white audience, this is what made them go pop. The white audience, they, they didn't know that they was black. They singing along with Sail On, you know, thinking, oh, they black guys. Hold on, wait a minute, right? That's what I love about that song, man, because, you know, uh, even with my movement, Music for Global Change, the, uh, uh, it's 12 notes, 12 notes on the piano from Bach to rock. And, you know, I teach kids all the time, fall in love with whatever, you, whatever genre you want to, even though it's been racism in music all these years. They don't want black people doing rock. They don't want black people doing country music, right? You know what I mean? But you'll see, you know, I did the New Kids on the Block last record. You know, you see white kids doing black music. You know, that's correct. There's, there's 200 million uh, white people in the country. It's 40 million black people, right? So, so, I mean, we'll and black people will go see white groups to play funk and R and B. You know what I mean? So, but they won't. They, you know, they won't do it. And I love, I, I love Ronald, uh, Lionel Richie did too, because. He went and did a whole duet album, country, with some of the biggest country artists. That is correct. That is correct. But, but Scott, um, my question to you, though, is now you also performed a, a song with Lionel Richie as well. Is that correct? I, I sang on one of his records, but I've never met him. Is that right? Now, how was that that you never met him? He never came and revisited the Commodores or anything while you were there? No, 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 man. And, and uh, but, but it was a trip because I was... Uh, there's a guy named Narda Michael Walden. You know who he is, right? Produced mm -hmm. Whitney. And well, uh, he had asked me to come sing background on one of Lionel Richie's songs. And, you know, I, but I told him, I said, I don't even know. I'd like to meet him one day, you know? Uh, and so at, after I left, uh, uh, an another brother used to play with Heat Wave. He took my place, right? Mm -hmm. But if I, I must, after two years, if you ain't going to give me no raise, I'm out, right? So that's the reason you left, because they weren't willing to give you a raise? That's right. Oh wow! Oh wow! That's pretty. That's pretty steep to not want to do that, and you're the lead singer. Yeah, but you know, for me, it was like top forty, right? You you singing somebody else's songs, you know, and uh, and I went on to become the, the, a top rate uh, background singer. For you've records. done some incredible things um, after you left the Commodores because you even performed with Whitney Houston, uh, sang background on some of her songs, Celine Dion. Um, the list goes on and on. What was that experience like? I helped raise the, raise the backgrounds uh, for I'm Every Woman for Whitney on, on the Bodyguard. Uh, the, the, uh, All the Man I Need, I sang on that song. But then I've done Barbara Streisand and, you know, and... Uh, like I said, I sang on the Titanic with Celine Dion, but I was doing all these records, man. That was an artist like show up tomorrow. And I'd never know who would be there. Quincy might show up tomorrow. Then, then he brought Tevin Campbell 
uh, to the studio, mm-hmm. and I wind up writing a song for Tevin Campbell on the Tevin album called. Little now, which Brother. one did you write? Which song did you write of his? It's called Little Brother. Little wow. Brother. Right. Now, 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 let's go back for one thing um, that you said I want to um, revisit. And we'll take your questions in a moment, ladies and gentlemen. You can settle down. You're going to get a chance to get your crack at asking questions to Skyler. <laughs> yeah, see, what a, what a storyteller this man is. It's fascinating. Now, Skyler, um, the Commodores, when they had you on, they weren't willing to let you write your own original material? They just wanted you to sing Lionel stuff? No, no. All I did was sing his stuff, right? So, so And I'm wearing his clothes, $5,000 suits, right? And uh, but did, you know what crazy man because we get to uh, Thailand and that was like our first gig and the media rushed they they rushed us at the plane when we getting off right and they're looking for Lionel and, and and the guys told me get get back get back don't don't go close to the media right and they didn't see me to that night when I came out right and so uh, you know and and they was Lionel kept teasing them like he's gonna come back right. And he never did, but, but oh, oh wow, oh wow, you know what I'm saying. So, so uh, you know, it's a trip because because Ronald told me Ronald lives in Auckland, New Zealand, and whenever Lionel goes to Australia, or Auckland, New Zealand, it's stuff like that. He uses Ronald. R- Ronald plays bass for him, you know, when he, when he goes over there, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's they they really still really beautiful friends, right? But uh, what? those wow. brothers they were older than me, so you know. Wow. Now, now, Skyler, um. With your goals, um, has music taken you further than you ever thought you would go? Or um, have you still a lot that you feel you have to accomplish? Well, I've been singing in, uh, I've been singing since 10 years old. I I started singing in nightclubs when I was 13. And by the time I was 15, I was an alcoholic, right? And, uh, you know, I'm on the basketball team too. So I go from playing basketball that, at seven o'clock and then I got to run to go get on the stage right now a band that I joined called Hot Ice uh uh these brothers everybody in the band was 21 and older and I wind up beating these other these older guys out for the gig but here's the crazy thing so we would do four 45 minute sets so 15 minutes the 15 minute break I couldn't be in the club I would have to go sit in the car and then they knock on the door, on, on the window of the car, and I come in and do my thing. But I was an alcoholic, man. So, man, I was jumping around on tables, and people were going, you got to come see this kid, man. You got to see this kid, Betty. You know? And you know what those guys are doing, though? Because, you know, I could get a Coca-Cola or a 7-Up for free, right? But what I'd do, I'd take it out to the car, and the guys would have a bottle of alcohol in the car, and I'd, I'd juice up, right? And when I come back, I'm ready to, ah, you know, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. But, but, you know, by the time I was 21, I quit drinking alcohol, right? I just like, I start seeing people that turn 21 when they get to the club, this is their first time there and they go drink like crazy. And I didn't want to do that no more. You know what I mean? So I stopped that, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I lived in Napa Valley before I moved here at a home, home in Napa Valley. So I drank wine later on in life, but, uh, you know, I just wore myself out from it. I just, you know, as a kid, I, I couldn't do it anymore. So, so now, Skylar, at your age now and many years, um, almost 40 years removed from being in, with the Commodores, what is your perspective on music now? How do you view it opposed to how you viewed it some 38 years ago? Well, when I started doing records and arranging backgrounds and harmonies for records for so many years, uh, you know, I, I used to watch it when we you know, I sing on Mariah Carey's record. A, a lot of people, you know, but but I used to see them set the set the lyrics up on the stand, and you don't know that song's go go be a hit or not, right? But we would create the background parts of that, and then you hear it on the radio, right? So that, that started happening all the time, man. Just you know, twenty twenty five hundred songs, right? No. So so uh, you know that that's. That's the cool thing with me. So, but but I learned how to do that, and then I learned how to produce after that, produce backgrounds and produce other vocalists and stuff like that. Well, now, after I, oh oh man, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hold on, my wife is locked. We'll take a commercial break, and then we'll be right back right after. That's this. right.
And welcome yeah. back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Char Sherrard, talking to the gentleman and the scholar, as well as the Commodore's legend, Skylar Jett, on the Sherrard Show, having a fascinating story. Uh, we're going to take your questions in a moment, but before we do, uh, let's talk about your music, your global music that you're using to change and touch the world. Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, uh, uh, for 15 years, I started right. Well, actually, in 1984, I wrote a song with Raul LaPred down in Alabama. And uh, what we did with the song was from the money from it, we gave it to every fourth child in a family for their college ed education. That's impressive. And, and it's really beautiful, man, because when we did the song, Sherrod, they played it simultaneously on every radio station in Alabama, right? Uh, it's called Keep the Music Playing. And the, the, the trippy thing, we was on TV and everything. And the next day while I'm leaving, I get on the plane and they gave me posters and I got stuff under my arms and stuff like that. And the next thing you know, man, I got on the plane and people start clapping. I saw you on TV last night. It's really beautiful. You're giving this money to all the kids, you know, for their college. Right. And right then I learned how powerful social conscious music was. Now, let's fast forward the to 207 i spent seven years to bring sly stone back to the stage and i wind up doing it why why sly stone why because you had, to, I, you had to convince them to come out back on the stage no 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 i i i, I me and his sister his youngest sister did a gig together for kamala harris Oh, wow. When she, when she was the district attorney, she was, she was about to be a district attorney for San Francisco. We played a big party for her and I met Sly Stone's sister. We sang background for this thing. So she said, we should do some more stuff. I said, I tell you what, why don't we put a band together and go out and do Sly Stone songs? But nobody could sound like them. But I believe if we go out and start singing the songs, people are drinking, they'll start singing along with us, right? And they did, man. And so I put together several bands like that with her, her and her and Sly Stone and niece. And uh, and and she goes, I think I think my brother wants to come back out. I, th I think he I think he's ready to come back out. And at at that time he was living up in Benedict Canyon, right? And and uh, so uh, my cousin gave me this book, and it had it was a directory for all the agents and managers and stuff. And I just start calling. I got Sly Stone. And people would hang up on me or cuss me out. That dude dead. He was still on drugs. I, I got all of that, right? Now he had a manager of 45 years. He couldn't do what I did. So I, so I, made, all, I made all the calls, made all the calls, right? And so there's a, uh, I don't know if it's still there. It was, was a club called the Knitting Factory. Mm -hmm. You know that's still there. there. That's still there. The, okay, so so a friend of mine, Preston Glass. I uh, know Preston. Okay, Preston called me one day and he said, "Skyler, uh, I know you got Sly's family and stuff like that. Well, I, I know these two guys. They want to do a documentary about Sly Stone." And uh, he goes, "Can you link us up with the family?" I said, "Yeah, but you got to do something for me." He said, "What? Get us a gig in Hollywood." And they did, but the, the way they did it was crazy. They got in the car and went down Hollywood Boulevard, honk and honk, honk if, honk if you love Sly, and, and big, big, people went crazy and stuff like that. So here we are, we practiced and we got down to LA and we go do the, we go do the uh, uh, knitting factory. Now, uh, vet, Sly's sister says, I'm gonna go get my brother and bring him to the gig. And she did. Right. Now, Scott, now, Scott, before you finish your story, now, what made um, Sly stop wanting to perform? Why did he stop performing? Well, you know, he had a little, had a little problem there for a while, you know what I mean? And, you know, but, but, but I got to tell you something, Sly, no matter what, that he had his problem, he's still a genius, man. Because Vet would, would come back to the Bay and play me songs that Sly wrote at his studio, and He's just so far ahead on the lyrical thing. It's so funky and all that, you know. So she said, I'm gonna bring him to the gig. And, and when he got to the gig, there was a partition that in that, in that club, 
there's an upstairs up there and we put a partition there and he sat up there and watched us do our show. And I said, I said, I said to everybody, I said, wait a minute. And these are a lot of young kids, you know what I mean? They, they weren't even born when Sly Stone was out, but they knew all his music, right? So I, I, I took the cell phone. I said, hey, did Sly, I, I'm calling the Sly right now. Tell him how much you love him. And he's sitting up there watching me do this, <laughs> watching me do this and seeing these kids going crazy. Well, the very, very next day, he called and said, I think I'm ready to come back. Let me back up a little bit. I used to own a record label doing all original, original wedding songs. And the reason why I did that, uh, weddings are $4.2 billion business in California alone. When you talk about the rings, tuxedos, uh, uh, everything, flowers, everything, right? And uh, so I said, I'm going I'm to do original wedding song. Nobody's doing that, right? Uh, bride, brides want something different. They get their dress, they want to. So I, I got into that business, but but my partner with me, when, when, when Vet called me the next day, she said, Scotty, you got us here. Took you seven years, and now my brother's ready to come out. What you gonna do? You go, you go, you are, are you gonna let somebody else take over or what you gonna do? It's a true story. I called my buddy up. I said, man, I'll tell you what, I got a chance to bring Sly out, but I need to get a PR person. He goes, Skyler, that's crazy that you say that. I was just in New York. He's a great photographer, right? I was just in New York and we was at this party and Sting was there, right? So this guy comes over to me and he says, hey man, I'm a, I'm a PR person. <laughs> can, you, can you get a picture of me and Sting? And so my buddy, no problem. So he, he took a picture of him. The guy he gave him his card, anything you want, man, just, just call me and stuff like that. And this is years later. So when I asked my buddy, do you know a PR person? He said, yeah, I got this guy, Skyler. And uh, he called him up and I start talking to the guy and he goes, if you think I'm crazy about Sly, you ought to meet my buddy down in Florida. His name is Steve Green. He had an a, a agency, right? So I got on, I got on with, with the guy. He said, well, well, can you really get him to me? I said, well, I'll introduce you to his sister. And I introduced him to vet. Two months later, we was playing at Disney down there in Anaheim. Wow. And I mean, will I am all of them out, out in the audience. And nobody believed he was going to show up because, you know, he had a, we had a reputation of not showing up, right? And he showed up. Wow. And that's all because of you. Well, I made the calls. <laughs> but, but, it, but, the, but the beautiful thing is, man, <clears throat> when we did that gig, uh, George Wallace, you know that comedian? The comedian, George yes. He calls us up and say, hey, man, I want you to guys come, come, come play up here in Vegas. Bring Sly. And we did. Sherrod, you know the craziest thing, man? People were betting that he wasn't going to show up in, La in Las Vegas. I had already did a sound check with him already, right? Now, we, had, we in the elevator going down to play. People were in the, in the, in the elevator betting that he wasn't going to show up, right? And lost their money. Well, well, first of all, we used to do like four songs before he came on, right? So sure, after two songs, I told you what going to show up. And they go to get their money, man, all stuff like that. And then when Sly came out, I mean, there was a line out the door in the hotel, right? And when, when, he, when, he, when he came up, when he, when he came up, people started running back into the, the venue. And man, after that happened, the rest is history. That agent calls us up. He said, I got 10 gigs for you guys in Europe. You'll play the Montreal Jazz Festival, all of them, right? So I got him 13 gigs. And uh, I paid everybody in the band. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to show you how musicians are, though, cold-blooded, man, because I paid these guys $800 a night to play with Sly. And I knew they weren't going to make that in a club anywhere, right? And uh, not one of them dudes ever said thank you to me. After, after all those years of just – all I would hear from, hey, man, where's the next gig? How about a thank you, <laughs> dude? You, you don't know how many – you're playing with Sly from the Family Stone. Unbelievable. Now, um, my question to you, though, Skyler, is what made you move abroad? Um, what, and we'll take your questions after this questions, ladies and gentlemen. We trust you. We will. You'll have your time <laughs> with that, Skyler. I'm not hogging that. But what made you um, uh, move out abroad? What was it so different about the music scene in England um, and in London and all these different places? Okay. When, when I started singing Sly songs with him, 
uh, I'm Everyday People, Hot Fun in the Summertime. And I'm listening to these lyrics. You know what, Sherrod? When you look back in those days, most of those songs were over at three minutes, right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this thing. I'm, I'm doing this thing. And I'm going, wow, man, these are basically social conscious songs. You know, he ain't talking about baby, nothing, none of that. You know, it's about happiness and stuff like that. And, and that gave me the idea to go back to do some social conscious music again. Plus, I saw all these young brothers getting killed. I said, man, I, I got to write something about this. And I wrote a song called Peace is the Answer. And, you know, I, instead of picking a gun up, put one down. That's how you can impress me, right? So I started writing all these, these social conscious songs, man. And my wife is uh, Brit. You know, she's uh, half Brit, half Scottish. Now, as I told you, I, got, I had four acres of, of grapes around my house. And I lived in Napa Valley. And uh, I was doing my radio show one day. And my, my wife went out. She got the tractor. And she was going to go out and start mowing the lawn on the tractor. But, and I had just got on the phone with the Prince of Benin, Africa, 9 million people. And I'm waiting for two weeks to have this brother on my show, right? And I get on with him and, and I'm with another sister from North Carolina. So we did the this, this show kind of mo like, like we're doing now. And I asked him my second question, man. And my wife ran in the house going, baby, I just got bit by a rattlesnake. I'm going, what? So I dropped the phone. I ran in the kitchen. I got a rubber band and I put it around her hand and you know, kind of lo located it. But then I put her in the car and I took off. But the phone is on the on the phone is on the floor. And my my, my co-host Denise is still talking to and they, where's Skylar? Where where you know? And and I lived on this mountain, man. So you can only do 15 miles an hour around the curves, right? And and Sherrod, I was doing at least 25, 30 going around the curve. Like if a, if a truck would have got, I went off the cliff, right? But I finally get her to the hospital. And, and I say, my wife got bit by a snake. So they took her in. But the only thing is, uh, the Mexicans out there that pick all the grapes and stuff like that, uh, there was no more anti-venom in the hospital, right? So, so what they did was uh, they gave her a shot of uh, penicillin. And they took, I, they took off. And we're sitting there going, because my, my neighbor next door, she had about 27 horses, right? She goes, Skylar, if you ever get bit by a snake, you only got 45 minutes before it gets up to your heart, right? And truth to things, Sherrod, when we're going around the corner, my wife, mm, mm, baby, you know, uh, I can feel it. I can feel it going up my arm. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm speeding and stuff, man. But, but so they give her a shot, man. The next thing you know, uh, they, they come back, give her a shot of that stuff. And I said, okay, can I take my wife home? And they go, no, we better keep her here so we can check her out every six hours, right? So I say, okay, I'm going to get some clothes and change, stuff like that, man. And, and I pick her up. And one month later, I got a bill for $90,000. I'm a musician with no insurance. Wait, so I said, can, can my wife stay? Can, can, can I take my No. Sherrod, right. they took her from the emergency room up to the fourth floor. I got another, I got another bill for thirty thousand dollars. That's just from having her stay overnight, right? So we took one hundred, one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and I, I'm going. This is insane. Okay, so a friend of mine said, "Hey, Skyler, did you make forty thousand dollars this year?" I said, "No, apply for Obamacare," and I applied for Obamacare. It wiped the whole bill out. Wow, that's praise God. That's awesome. That's right. Awesome. So one more thing. So then a month later, we had that. If you remember, we had that big earthquake in Napa. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, man. It, and, and when I got over the hill, a lot of the houses were flat, man. It was it was messed up. I had a, a friend of Sheila E's manager, her, her father's manager. He got hurt in the thing, you know, because he was in an apartment building. And, it, and it, well, anyway. Those two things right there, I say, okay, baby. I'm, she said, well, let's get out of here. Let, 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 come on, let's come, let's take our kid and go to school, send him to school over there, you know. And I said, let's go, right? My other kids are grown. Uh, so I said, okay, why not? I, you know, 
And, but the trippy thing is I'm trying to do this, my social conscious music, and nobody would even listen to me. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even listen to what I'm doing, right? If you ain't talking about baby this or got your pants hanging down, all that stuff like that, man. As matter of fact, this one woman that called me, she said, Scott, I want to help you. Uh, uh, and can I help you? And I said, yeah. So she started asking people. She said, yeah, I got this client. I, 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 he's doing social conscious music. And this one brother said to her, yeah, good luck with that. She started crying because she, she know I'm trying to help people out with my music, right? right, right. And so I get, over to, I get over here and people are like, hey, we love that. We need more of that, right? And, and a buddy of mine sings with Bobby McFerrin, right? Mm -hmm. And he, he, he's, a, he's a, a professor at Berkeley College of Music in Boston. And so he was going back and forth to Rwanda and he said, Skylar, I want you to come over here and do your, do your music in Rwanda. So I went to headline over in Rwanda and the most beautiful thing happened to me, Sharad. I did my music and when I got off, the press rushed me and they said, thank you, brother. We got all these singers come over here with their pants hanging down, cussing people out, you know, cussing women out and all that stuff like that. And here you are trying to help us with your music, right? And I, I thought that was a, that that really got my motor going at, at you know, at, at, at writing this social conscious. Music. That is so beautiful. That is be so beautiful. Uh, Scott, we got to take these questions because I've only got about uh, 10 minutes left and I want to be able to get to some of the questions. Um, <laughs> this question is from Adam. Now, Adam is um, reaching out for me from Florida. He says, first of all, I'm a huge, huge fan of the Commodores and your music. Uh, congratulations yeah. to you for all the great things you've done. His question is, did you have an input on We Are the World in 1984? Oh, no. That, that, was, uh, that was Lionel and, and Michael Jackson and Quincy and all those, right? Right. Mm -hmm. but, but, now, I, now his, but, but what's his name? Adam. The brother? A Adam, I do want to tell you this, though, because uh, before I moved over here, uh, a guy that I knew used to be uh, vice president of MCA Records, right? He told me uh, uh, that they still made $32 million off of that, that tune seven years ago. Wow. Wow. And that was, so, that was 1984, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate your question, Adam. All right. This is from Florence. This is from Florence. She is in New Jersey. She says, awesome, um, awesome job on being with the Commodores and the great music you make. Continue being an inspiration to young people. Um, where can we purchase your music and what's the latest album you have out? Thank you, Florence. Well, 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 um, I'm just putting some of my music up. It's on Spin Up. There's a there's a, a distribution company called Spin Up, uh, S P I N N U P, and uh, I, you know I have a few songs on there. But I'm about to put out. I don't do albums. I do singles, right? Because uh, I remember back in the day when you buy an album, maybe only two songs were good on the album. Correct. And, you know, so so I don't want to do people like that. Yeah. I put my singles up, and you can go get the ones that you want. But uh, 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 like I'm writing one right now. I'm doing a video to it. This one is uh, I want to dedicate it to dancers. Uh, it's to the art of dancing because musicians are out of work and so are dancers. So I wrote I wrote a song that's about to come out and it's really beautiful. Uh, I wrote a song about racism called Equal, and uh, wow. I, you know, pieces the answers about putting the guns down. Uh, uh, one world. If, if if they go to uh, uh, the global messengers.com. Okay, I global messengers, ladies and gentlemen, it is on your screen. Global messengers.com. The, glo the global, the global messengers.com. Okay, the and global I, messengers.com. And I did that with a brother from Ghana. So he's, he's singing in the language of Twi, mm -hmm. right? And I'm singing in English. But I, I, I wrote the track as reggae, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a really beautiful experiment. Very good. Okay, we have time for one more, la one last question. Uh, this is from Maria. This is from Maria. She is from Dallas, Texas. She says, I'm a humongous fan of the Commodores. Thank you for all of that great music from the 70s and 80s. Her question is, living abroad now, how many languages do you currently speak? I don't speak, it, you know, I still speak Ebonics. Those two. I'm <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the tricky thing is my son, we brought him over here. He's learning German. Uh, French and uh, German, French and, and Spanish right now, right? Wow. And the, the school that he's in, he'll learn four, he's 12, he'll learn four languages by the time he's 18. And we're really, that's really proud of that, right? 
Very um, good. We thank you so much for your question. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Um, but my question to you, though, is, uh, Skylar, where can your, the fans have all these questions be able to email you or be able to keep in contact with what you have going on? Info at Music for Global Change. There you go. It's right on your screen, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Scott, I want to first of all thank you for being a guest on the Sherrod Show. I'm very humble, fascinating individual. All right, at some point, are you going to put your life in a book? We have to know this because you have a capsule of wealth and wisdom that the world, these younger generation, needs to hear about. Yeah, I've heard, I've had some people approach me about doing documentaries about my life, you know, and um, but you know, it's because it, I'm a welfare child. I'm a single parent wel welfare child, and. Um, to, to be on 2,500 records and have a Grammy and all that stuff like that. Is, you know, I, I, I like to go out and talk to young single parent kids and tell them you can do anything you want to. You know, my, my dad wasn't there for me, but my arms is moving, my legs is moving, I'm breathing, I can make it from here. We want to thank you, Skyler, for being a guest on the Sherrod Show. We hope and pray you can do come back to the show so we can hear the other half of the story. Is that okay, sir? <laughs> Sherrod. Bless you for inviting me, brother. Thank you so much, man. And, and thank you for what you're doing uh, to help people out with their careers and, and, and give them a, a platform to tell their stories, right? I am Music. a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of life. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of fascinating people like you. And here at the Sherrod Show, we like to give you your flowers while you're still living. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that, brother. Uh, that, I, I, that's my, my uncle owns a, uh, a foundation where he goes and finds uh, old Olympians that's been holding records for 40, 50 years, right? And he said the same thing you said, Sherrod. He said, we need, they, they always write something about these people after they did. Let's go celebrate them while we, why, 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 why they living. Amen. Yeah. So, Skyler, I'm giving you your flowers and he will be back on the Sherrod <laughs> show, even if I got to go to London and get them. I oh, come on over you. here. You'll love it, man. You'll I love guarantee it. you. At some point, I hope and pray the Sherrod Show can do it in a few episodes in London and feature all the wonderful people because you all are all beautiful there, I'm sure, around the world. And also um, on our next episode of the Sherrod Show, we have uh, Judy Pace will be on the show, as well as DeFrance, the singer, the lead singer from Originals will be on as well. And then Master P. You don't want to miss those episodes, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sherrod. Yeah. Check out Essence Television. Enjoy your Saturday. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye now. All the best. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye now. All right, brother. <laughs>